Good evening. Goodbye Forever by Nat Town Rimsey. Chapter Six, The Mother of Invention. In terms of how chilled I'd become, I was monstrously glad to be back in bed. The full moon was gawping through the window. At first, I didn't really notice how bright it was, but when I noticed it, the moonlight seemed to illuminate the room. I wondered at first whether it was actually daylight but the clock on the wall told me otherwise. It was just gone two o'clock in the morning. I was still shivering, but not actually cold. Then I realised that the white lady was there. She had evidently been there for some time, but I had not seen her as soon as she appeared. I lay there staring at her. Then gradually I stopped shivering and fell asleep. Chapter 6, The Mother of Invention The appearance of Tara after my naked ride to the crossroads had been a joyful shock. Papa Legba had not shown, but that was not too violently disappointing. It ceased to be disappointing as soon as Tara appeared. I hoped she would appear again after that night, but my hope was in vain. She made a solitary appearance and then the days and weeks passed. Nothing. That wretched Skiffle Junior plastic guitar felt like a synthetic albatross round my neck. I wanted to be rid of it, but it had been a present. I felt that I couldn't throw it out with the rubbish. Although I was not too grateful, I did not wish to display ingratitude. My father had probably meant well, and he was not to know that I had any knowledge of guitars. He was not to know that I had actually played real guitars, and more. I'd played top-line Gibson and Fender guitars. <clears throat> All my father knew about Fender's was that they sat in front of the fireplace. He had no idea that giving me a plastic guitar was like giving a cowboy a hobby horse. My only alternative, therefore, was to do something with it. The nauseating appellation Skiffle Junior had to go. That was something, at least, that I could fix. I soaked it in a bath of hot water and was delighted by how easily the paper insert peeled away. <coughs> Excuse me. An ominously recognisable shape remained, however. It had obviously been remarketed as the Skiffle Junior, as the initial design had evidently been intended to glorify Mickey Mouse. The cartoon mouse face outline was all too apparent. With the careful use of a chisel and some wet and dry abrasive paper, however, I was left with a clean yet matted surface. I then painted the front of the guitar silver with paint designed for painting model aircraft. It looked far better after about a dozen coats and some work with Solvol Autosol, chrome polish, to take away the brush marks. So much for aesthetics. Next, I attached steel strings and hit a major problem immediately. The smooth aluminium tuning pegs provided no friction to hold a tuning, as they were turning against plastic. I'd used the lightest strings I could find. I even used a banjo string for the top string as there were no lightweight guitar strings around at that time. And the top string of a banjo provided a thinner gauge than the top string of a guitar. It was still no use. Chapter 
I thought about it for a while and eventually plucked up the courage to ask the woodwork teacher, Mr Reardon, whether I could make a project out of it in the woodwork lesson. The answer was yes, if wood was involved. I took the guitar to school on the appointed day and Mr Reardon helped me drill out the peg holes to a much larger size. I then glued in four hardwood dowels. I've got the dowel in a mahogany Victorian curtain pole from the local dump. I cut four sections to size, sanded and polished them. Once they were glued in, good and hard, I drilled four holes just large enough to ram in the aluminium pegs. Success! No still didn't work. I took the guitar home with a slight sense of dejection, but my father, having inquired about the project, surprised me by being helpful. He'd been pleased by my improvements in English at school. I'd risen from the bottom of the class to the higher bracket of my year, and he wanted to acknowledge my efforts. He was impressed too with the efforts I'd made with the Skiffle Junior and saw that I'd run into a wall with my project, despite having worked on it in the woodwork class. He seemed to recognise, a little late I thought, that the thing was a toy and that I was trying to make it into something real. Being a belt and braces man, when it came to making anything, my father suggested that I drill four tiny lateral holes through the sides of the headstock and fit four thin brass screws. These would prevent the hardwood dowels from moving, should the glue prove insufficient to the task. I roughened the aluminium pegs with emery cloth and lo and behold, it appeared to work especially with the violin rosin from Uncle Bernd's violin. I could now tune the beast. Well, no, I couldn't, because the aluminium pegs still slipped. My father was highly inventive with such practical problems and set about showing me how to make four larger pegs out of the mahogany curtain pole. There was plenty enough mahogany left. He looked at my Uncle Bernd's violin and copied the pattern with his tabletop lathe. You see, he said, the reason these aluminium pegs will not work is because they're not tapered. That means that you cannot get the required friction. He'd showed me how the pegs on the violin worked and I saw immediately how the problem could be solved. The pegs we made were much bigger and looked serious. I was delighted. It still wasn't a real guitar, but it was no longer a toy. It was now something that I could hand over to Papa Legba without having him whack me over the head with it in sheer disgust. I tuned it to a chord. I have no idea which it may have been and proceeded to strum it whilst fretting alternate strings at the third, fifth and twelfth frets. It sounded suitably like something from the Delta because the frets were never intended to represent anything close to correct intonation and the off-pitch row it made suddenly sounded suitably mournful to my ear. I showed it to Steve who was kind enough to say that it was a huge improvement. He tried to play it and pulled a face that made him appear as if he'd bitten into a citrus from hell. Vic, it's bloody horrible. Almost every note's either sharp or flat of where it should be. I thought it didn't sound quite right. Not quite right, Steve shook his head in dismay. It's more that it's quite entirely wrong. 
So, I ventured with desperate optimism dredged from the uttermost depths of wishful, think wishful thinking. Do you think there's anything I could do to improve it? Steve shook his head. No, Vic, that's impossible. Unless you sand it down the neck and put new frets on it. And that would cost a fortune because you'd have to take it to Eleuthia. And I doubt whether Eleuthia would touch it. Eleuthia, I queried. Yes, Eleuthia is someone who makes and repairs guitars. But as I said, even if you could find Eleuthia, Eleuthia wouldn't work on a plastic guitar. Oh. Steve noticed my bereft look and said, there might, there might be one way of changing it. I'll ask my dad and see what he says. Mr. Bruce took a look at it and said, the one thing you could do, and it might improve things, is to fit a tailpiece and a separate bridge. My brother Stan used to tinker with guitars and I have a box of guitar pieces in the attic that used to belong to him. I'll see what I can find. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. That is very kind of you. Think nothing of it, Vic. I'm glad to help. And so Mr. Bruce ventured into the attic with Steve and me standing at the bottom of the pull down ladder with hopeful expressions. Mr. Bruce ascended. After a few minutes, filled with the creaking sound of boxes being moved here and there, he descended with two objects in his hand, a tailpiece and a bridge. The bridge is broken and the tailpiece is quite rusty, but if you work on it, these things should fit the bill. The problem is going to be how to fit the tailpiece to the plastic body. I'm no good with this kind of thing, but what I imagine is it needs a piece of wood setting into the bottom of the lower bout. Mr. Bruce noticed my confusion and continued, the two bulges of the guitar are called bouts. The upper bout is where the neck joins the body and the lower bout is the one where the tailpiece and bridge are situated. Now, I wouldn't like to tell your father what to do because it's not for me to make suggestions, but if he were to find some way to put a wooden block into the lower bout, it would make it strong enough to hold the tailpiece. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bruce. That's wonderful. Don't be too happy about it yet, Vic. I have no way of knowing whether this will work. My idea is that by adjusting the position and angle of the bridge, you might be able to correct the intonation but it's something of a gamble. Don't be too disappointed if it doesn't work. The frets are somewhat approximate, but you might be able to play something on it. You like that Delta Blues, so maybe the result will not be too far off. Some of those old blues players used quite poor quality instruments. Fantastic, I beamed. That will make it more authentic. I admire your enthusiasm, Vic, he smiled, and left Steve and me to examine the bridge and tailpiece. The bridge was broken at one end, but that was not a problem because my guitar only had four strings. I could simply cut it to size. I'd position the four string remainder in the middle of the bridge cradle between the bridge height adjustment wheels. We took the tailpiece to the kitchen and took turns rubbing it with Solvol Autosol Chrome Cleaner. It took an hour, but by the time we were finished, it gleamed. What you need to do, Steve told me, is use the middle four holes. It will look much better with this tailpiece and a proper bridge, but the nut at the top is still plastic and that's part of what's muting the sound. It should be made of bone. Right. I, I don't suppose your dad's got anything like that in the attic. 
Steve asked his father and his father dutifully investigated the attic again, but found nothing that could be of use. I'll just have to ask my father and, and hope to find him in a good mood. When I got home, I showed my father the bridge and tailpiece and described how Steve and I had worked on them. My father looked at them for what seemed a long time and said, well, I think I may be able to work out a way to fit a wooden block into the base of this guitar, as Mr. Bruce has been so obliging as to provide the pieces. We walked up to the garden shed that he called the workshop, and he proceeded to look around amongst the different pieces of wood he had stacked on a shelf. There was a piece of dark red Iroko wood, about seven by five by five inches, that was left over from making the garden bench. He drew the curve of the low about and cut the block to shape and planed it down so that it would be a tight fit inside the guitar. Then, horror of horrors, he proceeded to cut into the guitar. I watched with trepidation at the exposed hole, but soon he had that piece of wood in place. He pondered for a moment and said, The problem is that although this gives the tailpiece a secure mount, it has to rely on the strength of the rest of the guitar and there's no strength in plastic. I think we need a rod that connects the neck with the wooden anchor piece. My father then did something quite amazing. He invented the truss rod. 